So in this last video, we're going to be talking about enzymes. Enzymes are needed to speed up chemical reactions inside cells. Chemical reactions in a test tube may take minutes or hours, and this simply isn't fast enough for cells. And so most biological chemical reactions can only occur fast enough in the presence of an enzyme. Enzymes are protein catalysts, and what this means is that they bring reactants together in precise orientations. And your textbooks call these reactants substrates, so I use these words interchangeably. But when substrates are in these precise orientation, this makes them the reaction more likely to occur. Enzymes are also specific for a single kind of reaction. I'm going to start by telling you about my favorite enzyme. This is myeloperoxidase, or MPO, and it's a peroxidase enzyme. It's made up of four polypeptides, and so what you're looking at here is its quaternary structure. MPO is expressed specifically in a cell called a neutrophil, which is a type of white blood cell. And one of the reasons it's interesting is it because it contributes to the green color of pus. So this enzyme binds to a small molecule called heme. And when it binds, it actually forms a covalent bond with heme. And this gives the heme unique spectral properties that turn it green and turn the molecule green. And so what happens is during an infection, you get neutrophils arriving at the site of infection. They're fighting the pathogen, but a lot of them die. And when they die, they, they burst open and release their MPO. So if you have a lot of dead neutrophils, you have green pus. It also catalyzes the following chemical reaction, which I think is a very cool chemical reaction. What it does is it takes hydrogen peroxide and a chloride ion and turns it into HOCl and water. And HOCl or hypochloric acid is actually the active component in bleach. So this is a really powerful antimicrobial that's made inside your cells that's capable of killing pathogens. So this is why I think MPO is cool but we're gonna talk more about enzymes and all of their properties next. So for a reaction to take place, reactants or substrates need to collide in a precise orientation, and they need to have enough kinetic energy to overcome the repulsion between electrons in atoms that come into contact as they form bonds between one another. And enzymes help reactions clear these two hurdles. Enzyme catalysis has three steps. The first step is called initiation, and that's shown here. The substrates are precisely oriented so that they can bind into the active site. Step two is called transition state facilitation, and this is when there are interactions established between the substrate and the R groups extending into the active site of the enzyme, and this lowers the activation energy needed for the reaction to take place. The final step is called termination, in which the products are formed they're re and released, and the enzyme can be reused. And we're gonna talk about these three steps in more detail. So during initiation, what happens is that enzymes bring together specific substrates. And so here's an example of glucokinase, and what this enzyme does is it binds glucose and ATP, and it binds them in their active site. And this enzyme is going to help these two molecules come together in a precise orientation that's going to allow them to break some bonds and reform others to make a product. When these substrates bind to the enzyme, it, the enzyme undergoes a conformational change. And when the substrates are bound to the active site, it goes from this open form to this clamped form around the substrates. And this change in shape or change in conformation is called the induced fit model. The induced fit model is favored over an older model called the lock and key model because it accounts for an enzyme's dynamic and flexible properties, right? These shape changes that take place when an enzyme has bound to its substrate. So the next step is called the transition state facilitation step. And in this step, substrates bind to the R groups in the active site via hydrogen bonding and other interactions. 
And this forms, so here's our substrates, this forms an intermediate condition called the transition state. And so A forms kind of a temporary bond with both B and C. Activation energy is needed, is a kind of energy that's needed to strain the substrate's bonds so they can reach this transition state. And enzymes lower the activation energy. This is a really critical point. The free energy of the, of the system or whether or not the reaction is spontaneous or the change in energy between the substrates and the products, it never changes. And this might be a quiz question. Once the products are formed in termination, the products are released, um, but the enzyme is never consumed and so it can keep processing new substrates. So again, this is our free energy equation we talked about before. And so we have our reactants that reach this transition state and there's a certain amount of activation energy that's required to strain those bonds to reach the transition state. And then we have our products. And in this equation, or in this free energy graph here, the reactants have higher potential energy than the products. And so this reaction would occur spontaneously enzymes would change the shape of this graph. And the part of the graph they would change is actually the activation energy. So this is a really critical point. The activation energy is lower in the presence of an enzyme, but the delta G, whether or not a reaction is spontaneous or, or not, does not change. And so that part of the graph remains the same. So what are the limits for enzyme activity? The speed of an enzyme catalyzed reaction looks something like the graph below. So here in blue, first, I'm going to show you an uncatalyzed reaction. So here we have substrates in a test tube without the enzyme. And you can see that the, that the product will form, right? And it's somewhat dependent on the substrate concentration, but the product actually forms pretty slowly, right? Here's an enzyme catalyzed reaction shown in red. So this upper line here, this increases linearly at low substrate concentrations. So this reaction is dependent um, on the concentration of the substrate, but the reaction act or the enzyme activity actually slows um, as the concentration of the substrate increases and reaches maximum speed at these high substrate concentrations. So all enzymes show this type of, we call it saturation kinetics. And this is because active sites cannot accept substrates any faster. No matter how large the concentration of substrates gets at this point, there's simply not enough enzymes to make more products. And reaction rates level off because of all of the available because all of the available enzyme molecules are being used. The enzyme can also be limited if its shape changes. Recall with proteins that the structure is critical to its function. And the structure is mediated by bonds that help the protein fold. And these bonds can be interrupted by changes in temperature and changes in pH. So temperature affects the folding of of a molecule, so it can it can change um, or it can decrease the enzyme activity, but it can also affect the movement, the kinetic energy of enzymes and substrates and increase their activity or the enzyme's activity. Similarly, pH can affect the enzyme's shape and, and reactivity. So pH can change the status of those ionic and basic R groups and, and disrupt their interactions with each other, break apart ionic bonds, or maybe break apart other bonds. And so each enzyme has evolved to be best in its uh, surroundings. And so each enzyme has an optimal temperature and pH. And let's take a look at that. So here's two graphs. Okay, one's looking at enzyme activity or uh, of a specific chitinase. Um, and its dependence on temperature. And the other one is looking at its dependence on pH. Okay, so this purple line here, 
This shows the enzyme activity um, of chitinase from a bacteria that lives in a cool, neutral environment. Okay, so this enzyme or this enzyme works best at around 45 degrees Celsius. And then it doesn't work so well when the enzyme is brought into a higher temperature. Okay. This is compared to if you isolated this enzyme from a bacteria that lives in a hot and acidic environment. Well, you see this enzyme, it actually peaks with its activity at 60 degrees. So it has, it can, it functions even better 10 degrees at a 10 degree higher temperature. But this also falls off and that's because at these higher temperatures, the proteins are going to be natured. So they're going to be um, broken down into their primary structure and no longer functional. We can look at the same thing with pH. We'll go through this as quick as uh, slowly, but this, um, the enzyme from bacteria that lives in a hot acidic environment works best at a pH of two. And the um, enzyme isolated from bacteria that lives in this cool neutral environment works best at a pH slightly above six or maybe seven. And so you can see they're adapted to their environments, but under extreme conditions, neither one works very well. Okay, so that's environmental changes that regulate enzymes, um, but they're also regulated on a cellular level. And there's a lot of regulatory molecules that control when and where an enzyme functions. They may work by changing the enzyme structure or by changing the ability to bind its substrate. They can also either activate or inactivate an enzyme function. So let's talk about classes of regulatory molecules that control enzymes. So we're gonna separate these into um, molecules that bind to enzymes non-covalently. So that's the first one we'll talk about. And then molecules that make covalent modifications to enzymes. So these non-covalent interactions can be referred to as reversible, okay? So the first one I'll talk about is shown up here in A, and this is competitive inhibition. So here's our enzyme, and it can bind substrates in its active site. But there are there's regulatory molecules that can also bind in the active site. And when they bind, they compete with the substrates for the active site, and so the substrates can't bind. So they're competitive, right? They're stealing this site on the enzyme so that they can't produce the product. Another type of regulatory molecule is called allosteric, an allosteric regulator. And what this does is it binds somewhere else besides the active site and it changes the shape of the enzyme. Okay, this is still reversible. So here's that shown here. So this is what's called an allosteric activator. And so what this does is it binds, it's a protein or a molecule that binds to the enzyme somewhere else that's not the active site. And this changes the shape of the enzyme and essentially opens up the active site to now bind its substrates. Down here, this is the reverse. This is an allosteric inhibitor, again, it binds somewhere else besides the active site, and this changes the shape and essentially closes the active site to substrates. And so this is one way that cells can regulate when they want an enzyme turned on or turned off. The other group of um, ways, or the other way to regulate enzymes is by covalently modifying them. This can be reversible or irreversible, um, and it, the irreversible changes often result from the cleavage of peptide bonds. So you're cutting apart the enzyme. Um, the most common reversible modification of enzymes is just the addition of phosphate groups. And so that's shown here. We have glycogen phosphorylase B. We have a, an enzyme called a kinase. We'll talk about this a lot when we talk about signaling. But this enzyme adds phosphate groups to other proteins. And so in the presence of, of ATP, we can phosphorylate, we can add a phosphate group to this glycogen phosphorylase. And this, app, this phosphorylation, it's a really important, it plays a really important role in signaling. And often it causes a shape change or a conformational change in the protein. And 
it can either activate or inactivate the protein or the enzyme. And potential energy is not used up in this, in this reaction, but here, when this is phosphorylated, it can then degrade glycogen. Okay, so to summarize those last points, enzymes are influenced by the concentration of the substrate. We didn't talk about this, but they're also influenced by a group of molecules called cofactors and coenzymes. I briefly talked about heme. That's an example of a prosthetic group. These are just vitamins and other small molecules that bind to enzymes and influence their behavior. Enzymes are influenced by temperature and pH and uh, allosteric um, regulation, competitive inhibition. And we didn't talk about this because I'm saving it for when we talk about um, metabolism, but they're also regulated by this process called feedback inhibition. Anyways, that's it for now, and I'll see you all in class. Bye.